Katie, you look like you're getting ready to bake cookies or just finishing baking cookies. Yes, our cookie has, uh, our kitchen has thrown up cookies. Okay. Um, it's just everywhere. So I'll be bopping in and out to finish. But here I go. I look more professional now. No, oh, no, that's quite all right. I, I put it on, put a little elf hat on. You look perfect. Look like you're <laughs> in Santa's workshop. Okay, I am, we are recording, so I have to stop being foolish. I am going to call this meeting to order at 631 of the Windsor Southeast Supervisory Union, number 52, um, on the December 18th. Um, are there any changes, additions to the agenda? Okay, good. Just the way I like it. <laughs> um, we'll uh, look at uh, approve the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from November 27, 2023? So moved, Davis. Second, Nancy. There you go, Nancy. Um, <laughs> are, is there any discussion input about the minutes? When I read them, they seemed as concise and wonderful as usual. Elizabeth sometimes has some stuff. So I see Elizabeth has joined and we're doing the minutes right now, Elizabeth. Oh, she joined again. <laughs> yes. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes of November 27th, 2023, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Anybody abstain? Okay. Uh, moving on to, well, I'm actually looking at the minutes, not the agenda. I'm like, hey, we did that already. Um, public participation. Um, Carrie, you have a quick question? Yes, it's, um, there's actually two pieces to it. Um, I did ask this at the Weathersfield School Board, but I just want to ask here as well. I'm just wondering, um, as regard to the SU budget. Um, so, Carrie, if you can hold on a second. I, we haven't actually got into my, the public participation yet. Um, I thought maybe you had a procedural. Um, at the start of public participation, I read a quick disclaimer. And if you would allow me to read that, so everyone knows what sort of rules we're under, and then we'll go right back to your question. Okay. Okay, thank you. Public comment is not legally required, but we believe it is crucial for us to hear from our community members about their concerns over issues. Through these meetings, our board models for our students how to conduct public discourse and that the board and members of our community can approach controversial issues in a civil and constructive manner and can demonstrate mutual respect. Having said that, please note that the board is here to listen. The public comment period is not designed for discussion. Please state by identifying yourself and by in what town you reside in. Carrie Jewell, I believe that you have the floor and you reside in Wethersfield? Yes. Um, so my two questions um, are, one, I understand how the SU budget is established and how the assessment like there's a formula, I get that. My question is, is it a school policy or is it a agency of education or state of Vermont law that the SU budget gets approved prior to the local budgets needing to be passed? And the second part of that is, I am wondering if there's been further conversation since um, Albert Bridge joined with um, Windsor to create Mount Escutney because I'm newer to the community. Um, why that district has six members on the SU board in Wethersfield and Heartland only have three? Yes. Um, usually we don't go into to discussion, but as a board member, I, I feel these are very quick questions. Um, and I will, I don't know exactly, even though I've read the law recently. 
uh, the SU is required to create a budget um, by a certain date. Um, and I can look up that date for you. Um, I have it in a document because this question has come up at the weather's field. So that's why I've been researching. But yes, the, the, the procedure and steps of how the um, an SU is created, uh, what sort of power it has, and when it has to create a budget for a certain timeline um, is within state law. It may also be, but I don't think so. I, it may also be some uh, within the State Board of Education, uh, um, some of their guidance. Uh, when dealing with education law, there's always two sort of areas in which bring it in. Actual uh, 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 Code 16, um, which covers education law and State Board of Education rules. So I don't know where the State Board of Education rules come in. But there is a, a, a time date in which we have to have that approved by. I just can't remember the date. And um, the reason for the uh, the Escutney board having um, six members and it was voted on by um, the entire SU boards that uh, the reason is because it's two towns. So technically right now, each town has three board three board members on the SU board. Also at the time, um, it felt that uh, the issue board had worked so well together that it, it seemed logical not to change the balance in the membership of it. So uh, it's possible, though, that could be if enough interest was to revisit it, that that's just handled through our, the local boards? That's a good question. I don't believe so. I think it would have to be voted on. Uh, hmm, there's some sticky points there because one, that agreement, I believe, is codified in the um, articles. Articles. The articles yeah, the articles of agreement. Um, it doesn't mean that those articles of agreement can't be changed. I'm just not quite sure what the procedure would be. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I've taken enough time. I really just wanted a couple of, so I kind of know where to head in my research. Thank you for your time. Okay. Larry, you had your. No, I think you hit the nail on the head with the Act 46 uh, School Board of Education, uh, the State Board of Education, the SU, and the, the local towns requ uh, requested a waiver from the State Board of Education to not have to merge. Um, so if you remember, we had one merger on one side, which is Windsor, West Windsor, and then Heartland and Weathersfield asked to stay separate. And as part of that, uh, getting the State Board of Education to bless it, uh, they said they would keep this set up of the SU. Yeah, it's important. It The whole governance of education in the state of Vermont is a little funky, but one important point is a lot of things that we do are dictated by the state. We can't mix and change our SU. The, the creation and the setting of a supervisory union is completely in the hands of the state legislature. It, it's this, or the, and the Department of Education. We have no power of that. So for an example, if one school district wants to leave an SU, the actual SU and the school districts have no power and no recourse to do that. Um, and SUs, along with the power of a superintendent, really is codified in state law, um, which limits what can happen. Now, a discussion on reorganizing the school district and merging other school districts, I'm sure the state would enjoy that. but. At, at the time that we merged, uh, it was pretty clear Heartland and Weathersfield was not were not ready to to entertain those ideas, and may never be, and that's fine. So, but um, 
and I have to ask everyone's excuse for taking the time in this one thing because I, I feel it's quite important. Okay, Are, is there any other public participation? Okay, uh, moving on with the administrative report. Uh, can, I make, can I make an announcement first, Bill? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I was working with Larry and actually Davis today, getting uh, timelines ready for uh, um, budget meetings and elections. So just an announcement that petitions for running for board seats um, are due January 29th. If you're a Mount Escutney school board member, those petitions go to Larry. He's our school clerk. Um, in the other towns, they would go to the town clerk who also functions as the school clerk. And um, we have to post the warnings and the sample ballots by February 1st. So we need those um, petitions by March, uh, sorry, not March, January 29th. And just just to let you know, um, in Mount Escutney, Elizabeth, Rebecca, and Megan are up. Hartland, Nikki, and Colleen are up. I know Colleen has announced she's not running. I know Rebecca also announced at the last meeting she's not running for Mount Escutney. And then Weathersfield, I believe it's Mark, Vincent, Sarah, and Jamie are all up this year. So just an announcement to get people thinking about um, what they um, need to do. Christine, yes. I don't think that Vincent is up. I believe he was elected for three years last year. I was actually gonna mention that to Lori. I just saw that just when I was entering this meeting, his date is wrong on there. Okay, so it's just Mark, Sarah, and Jamie? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Anne Marie. You're welcome. Okay, that was the announcement. Thanks, thank you, Bill. Oh, that's quite all right. And you have the floor still. Okay, I think Tracy's gonna go first. Tracy, do you want me to share my screen or would you like to share your screen? I can, I'll give it a try here and uh, hopefully that will work out. Yeah. Let me know if y'all can see this. I'll turn it into a slideshow. All right, great. So uh, tonight, uh, it's nice to see some of your faces, um, the ones that I can see on my screen. Uh, did not send out any pre-work thinking, I mean, you didn't really, we didn't have a lot of time between meetings, plus this seemed just like a good time to share some updates about what's going on. So I'm just gonna roll through this and please uh, anybody jump in, raise your hand at any point if you have any questions. So first I wanted to um, offer some spotlights. I didn't get a chance to say some of these things out loud at the last board meeting. So I just wanted to be sure to acknowledge and publicly thank Gadakana. If you are not familiar with Gadakana, uh, they are an organization that is led by and focuses on supporting Native American youth. Uh, one of the programs that they have is called the One Shelf Book Project. And so uh, they go through, they review a number of books and they're looking for uh, books that depict indigenous characters in culturally appropriate, historically accurate and positive lights. And so they have a whole collection of books and they uh, gift them, they gift them out to schools. And so we were a recipient of their one shelf book project and we've got a bunch of books now in our schools and the librarians were excited and they shared them uh, between some of the libraries. And so I just wanna note, this is a place you'll hear me uh, come back to talking about things like developing land acknowledgement. These are the kinds of things that I see us doing in relationship with and partnership with uh, folks who are local and indigenous. And so we're looking forward to continuing a partnership with GEDAC. Uh, a couple other things that happened in the last month or so, uh, we had a number of students who uh, came to, a, it's a GSA, Gender Sexuality is Alliance uh, conference that was led by Outright Vermont. It's an opportunity for students to go and to develop leadership in hosting their own. I know uh, we used to have a committee, uh, an alliance that was part of Windsor School. And so it's um, it was an opportunity, again, leadership development for some students who are now meeting and will continue to meet as this GSA within Windsor, which is great. They have that support um, and yeah, we'll see where they take it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that there are some students from Windsor Middle School who I think I mentioned last time how there was a uh, Colleen put out word to see if there were any students in the middle school who were interested in showing up to work on anti-hate and uh, 18 kids came out. Uh, Christine and, and Colleen and I were there for the meeting. And so one of the ways that we were channeling some of their energy and interest was into starting to make some posters 
twice a year, there's this national campaign that's called Us First Hate. They have posters, students can submit posters. Although the students didn't submit any for this timeline, there's another one that's in April. But the point is, is that 18 kids showed up from <laughs> Windsor Middle School to try and work on stuff. This is some more, this is one of the posters that a couple students made. Uh, I'm sorry that it's small, but they have an acronym for bully, which is things like be a friend. And so it's kind of redefining what bully can mean. Uh, that's just one of the one of the projects the students are working on. I'm actually going over to Windsor every Monday now during the lunchtime hour and holding that to help support some of the some of the cool things that students want to do, like reading books to younger kids about uh, about diversity, about community, uh, doing posters. And we're also going to get them involved in, um, I'm highlighting this particular slide because Windsor has been uh, noting monthly themes, right? So this last month, uh, the theme was around universal human rights. And so there was an opportunity to have, there's going to be more of an opportunity to get students involved in helping to educate folks around whatever the monthly theme is. There's, um, you know, we're all familiar maybe with like Black History Month that's in February, so themes like that, but have it be more student-led, have students responsible for making bulletin boards, uh, figuring out activities. For Universal um, Human Rights Month, they actually share, there were a number of videos that were shared about different identities, which can become part of our advice. There's just lots of opportunity to be more intentional about highlighting and lifting up these monthly themes and getting students involved in helping us do that. So we're gonna look forward to more of that. This is something that just started last week. I know there have been questions like Elizabeth has talked about Act One, right? Talking about how we've got the educational quality standards, the new ones that are coming out. And so um, I think I've mentioned this before that the Vermont Coalition for, uh, sorry, the Vermont Education Justice Coalition is hosting a class that's about, it's called Applying Inclusive and Equitable Teaching Practices that's aligned with these educational quality standards to help support us thinking about how we bring these into our schools. And so um, I just started the class last week, but this is just a little glimpse into some of the things that they're sharing. This is something that we could potentially, and this is, you know, we'd have to figure out how we would do something like this, but it's basically a reflection activity for educators to do things like, um, you know, examine your own cultural identities, reflect on how your identities shape your teaching. So it's a reflective tool uh, that educators can use to think about how are they really bringing in diversity, equity, inclusion into their classrooms. So more to come on that as the class progresses. So I'll pause there for a second, just see anything coming up for folks, any questions, comments? Okay, I'm gonna keep rolling along. So um, I wanted to share back some notes we've had. We shared the equity audit findings with all staff a couple months ago. And since then we've been going out to each of the schools for some follow-up meetings. We'll have two of them. So we completed the first round of follow-up sessions. So during, this, the, during these follow-ups, it was really an opportunity to engage staff and find out you know, what meaning are they making out of the equity audit? What are they noticing about some of the findings? And so I'm going to share some notes with you that have come up from uh, these follow-ups. And I'm gonna frame it, if, if this looks familiar to you, this individual cultural institutional, this was the same framework that I offered when we were talking about race and racism, uh, thinking about how racism can play out institutional, cultural, individual levels. This is also a way to organize, right, how we're creating change over time, to look in these three areas. So that's how I organize this. And I think I'm gonna use this model too for sharing different um, updates with you all and, and hope this makes sense. If it doesn't, please stop me anywhere. So a couple of things I just wanna note is that the notes from these follow-up meetings came from the audit. The audit was done last year. So it doesn't mean that these notes are reflective of what's happening right now. It's, it could be like as people are processing some of the findings, maybe they're also connecting it to something that's going on currently, but it's a little bit of a mix of both. Okay, uh, so some of the notes that came out along institutional lines, what were, what were people noticing about the audit? Uh, this is 
again, and, and there was no scientific uh, analysis of these notes that I'm sharing right now. This could be one person. I tried to pull things that were mentioned at least a few times across the groups. We also know that not everybody attended these sessions. So there may be things that are also missing from what, from what I'm sharing. But um, there was definitely an interest in some more professional development. There was a noticing that uh, equity and diversity and inclusion is not consistent across grades and schools. Uh, some uncertainty, we've seen this before. Uh, I think we've even talked about this. Some, some uncertainty or lack of clarity around what we mean when we say equity. I know we've talked about that as a board, like having the board get to a place where you all are also defining what educational equity means. There's also, like people know that we have policies, but there is sometimes a disconnect. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear my dog uh, with his toy in the background, but at home. <laughs> uh, okay, so policies, we've got some great policies, but sometimes there's a disconnect and people don't know everything that's happening in the policies. Uh, so some other comments were that, you know, there was some great work happening before COVID, COVID disrupted the work. Uh, and so now it's sort of like we're, we're, we're trying to get back into it. Uh, people felt like a little bit communication, accountability, a little bit lacking. Uh, yeah, there are some comments about curriculum, but I, I, I want to note, too, that there are a variety of comments around curriculum from people saying, oh, it's not diverse. You'll see later that there are folks who do say it is really diverse. So it's a little bit of, of a mixed bag. On a cultural level, uh, culture varies school to school. We know that there are slurs, there are, there are jokes that are happening, uh, not very funny jokes, right? There, there are hurtful, harmful uh, things that folks that are being said in our schools. We know that that's happening. Some people felt like unconscious bias may be a factor in that, that there's also some, some disagreement, different perspectives between school teachers, families, um, wondering what we're doing to make the theme of belonging relevant. What does that really mean on a cultural, on a cultural, uh, I don't know, for, for, for our culture? What does it mean to really belong? Some different understandings about trauma. We need more feedback, follow through. You know, again, student staff experiencing some hate and discrimination and some unchecked behaviors. This isn't, there shouldn't be anything in here that is surprising to, to see that's noted. On an individual level, people wondering, like, are they being spread too thin? Again, this theme of, of a lack of training and education. Some wonderings around whether students are able to be themselves or if kids may be hiding feelings, you know, that we don't recognize or realize. Uh, there is a sense that individual teachers may bring in some diversity, equity, inclusion into their classrooms. Um, Maybe it connects with curriculum, maybe it doesn't, uh, but it's really individual teachers who already have this awareness who are able to bring stuff into the classroom. Teachers are trying their best. They got a lot going on. Uh, some not feeling heard, uh, feeling like some guidance is a little disjointed. I think that also uh, reflects to like communication and, and, and really having a plan for how we're doing all this work. And so lots of room to grow. Uh, what I want to also touch on, too, is that within all the notes that came up, there are also lots of opportunities. We asked people about opportunities. We also asked them about what are some of the things that you're already doing in your classrooms that we know are these promising practices and examples for what we could do more of. So again, just organizing this around. And this is where having our anti-racism policy, this is where I think I said last time, like, this is like my work plan, right? I mean, these are some of the goals that we have in the anti-racism policy. These are also the goals that we have generally and broadly for diversity, equity, and inclusion in each of these three areas. So um, some of the places people noticed uh, promising things happening, right, on an institutional level could be some of the classes, right? There are classes that are being offered that are really looking to uplift, affirm marginalized identities and groups like the gender studies classes that are happening. I think that's a new class happening in the high school this year. Programs like flexible pathways, personal learning plans, Here's a comment, like I mentioned, right? Our new CKLA, the new uh, curriculum has a lot of diversity and equity, safety plans. So again, these are just some examples people offered on an institutional level, some promising things that are happening. On a cultural level, there are some amazing teachers. I don't know if I've said her name out loud, but Destiny Lawyer is a phenomenal teacher. If you go into her classroom, she has like every book on every identity, like 
tons and tons and tons of resources. And she is really teaching kids about diversity, uh, all this stuff, right? So um, lots of promising things happening in classrooms, um, folks inviting guest speakers to speak to different uh, identities. That's happening a little bit more, um, or it's happening in some cases. I'd like to see that happen a little bit more. Uh, community dinners and events. Again, thinking about engaging with families and communities. Uh, collaborative problem solving is something that's happening in some schools. Leader and Me has some really cool, we heard from a third grade teacher who was talking about one of the things Leader and Me asked classes to do is to create a classroom mission statement. And she said her class uses this mission statement they came up with every day as a way for saying like that they all belong in this classroom together. So it's like it's one of those places we can look for alignment um, in, in some of the things that we're already doing. Uh, and then there were some examples of what some individual teachers are doing also. And more broadly, I know I'm not going to read through all of these. It's got really tiny print on it, but you have um, you have the slides. And so these are just, again, a way of organizing some of the things that are happening, some of the things we're excited about. One thing I'll mention is we've been talking about restorative practices before I started here. We have somebody from Greater Falls Community Justice Center who is holding January 22nd to come and work with the middle school students at Windsor. So to start, idea is like if we can start training them one hour a month on some restorative practices, then those middle school students were building their leadership and their ability to actually interrupt, uh, to interrupt hate where it shows up, right? And then they can be keep uh, culture holders really for their for their class and for their grade. So excited about that. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to highlight in here? Oh, the Heartland, I've mentioned Heartland has a middle school student group that's really, they're working on an audit for the physical building. Again, looking for who's represented in the building, who's not. We're seeing if there's an opportunity to connect what they're doing with the Windsor students. So there's a little bit more sharing back and forth. Um, there's a lot going on. And so what I will say is that uh, the goal is for um, this spring is to have a roadmap, you know, here are the next three years, here's where all of these activities uh, fit in, here's how they connect, here's how they align, here's how they support some of the things that we have been doing. So all of that will be coming, uh, I'd say by spring for a little more clarity. All right, <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Big party over here. So. I'll pause there. These were just in case anybody wanted to share anything that you're seeing that get, that has you excited about what's coming up um, or anything that you're feeling like you where where you might want support as an individual or as a board member. So I'm going to pause, see if anybody has anything. I'm going to stop sharing also. Davis. Yeah, thanks, Tracy, for uh, for giving us an update on you know the kind of breadth of uh, of what you've been doing and what's going on right now. I think that you know starting with some of the challenges that we're still facing um, is a a good place to go. You know, we're always going to have something to uh, to be moving towards. Um, it, just in a general sense, I think hearing about what the students are working on, what's you know what's motivating them. I know that we talk a lot about student voice and choice in our SU and, and seeing how students have taken some of these opportunities and are, and are finding ways to, you know, express themselves and start conversations and, and, and build understanding in the student body and the school community is very, uh, very encouraging. So yeah, just appreciate hearing more detail about that and seeing some more of the opportunities that are coming up for, uh, for our student and for our faculty. Cool. Thanks, Ava. Mark. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, I'm really reassured um, by hearing that there's a roadmap um, for progress coming out in the spring. Um, that's always been the my biggest concern about this is that we've got these big overarching themes of how we want the learning environment to look and who we want it to include. And I, I've just never really had the time to look at all of it and then figure out how we're going to get there. And it sounds like by waiting for the spring to, to do a, a rough rollout and, and a roadmap, it, it just shows me that you're, you're taking the time, you're taking the consideration, and you're, you're taking the input in from the entire establishment. So thank you very much for that. 
You got it. Rebecca, hello. Um, hi, Tracy. Um, I really appreciate how you have broken down um, the um, approach to um, this discipline through the lens of a institutional lens, a cultural lens, and an individual lens. I think it helps me and uh, hopefully others also really be able to understand it better um, and 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 try and um, look at you know, and understand what is institutional, what is cultural, and what is individual. I think that that's been so helpful. And so I wanted to thank you for that process that you have created and are putting out. Great. Thanks for sharing that. That's helpful to hear too. I won't do things if they're not useful for you all. So thanks for that. Elizabeth, hey. Hi. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This is, I, um, I, I agree with what everybody has said so far and it, and seeing like how many kind of uh, irons you have in the fire is really exciting. And uh, I, I was wondering um, whether you're getting enough support and whether like, what does it look like when you go to talk to individual teachers versus talking to teachers in a group? Um, and do you have a, different response from teachers when you talk to them individually as you build those relationships? Thanks. Good questions. Um, I would say part of the roadmap uh, will likely include things like, I would love to have teachers who have some stipended roles, you know, next year who could be building based folks who are more, I mean, it's a model that other schools have. They have like equity coaches within schools. So I'm curious about that. Um, and whether that's something that would work here. Um, there are a couple of things I think with individual teachers, you know, it varies. Sometimes teachers will reach out with a specific request around something. And so uh, it's been great getting to know teachers that way. Some people show up for those Monday meetings that I've been holding space for, like the DEI restorative practices. I think people just aren't really sure yet what that space is for, but, um, I'll share one cool thing that happened at Heartland um, was actually in response to, um, they, they wanna get better, right? At interrupting when people hear things like during a meeting, when somebody may say something they want, and, and then everybody's silent because they don't know like how to interrupt or how to practice that. And so I was at their last all staff meeting offering up some ways, cause I'm thinking the March, I'll have a training spot like a, a couple hours during the in-service to offer a session about interrupting hate, you know? And so if we all have some of those same signals and they're like, well, some of us not, might not be able to make it. And one of the teachers offered like, hey, maybe we could put together a committee of folks who like some of us could go, but then we could be the building based folks to bring that practice back here. I was like, that's, that's, that's amazing. Cause that's actually what we're hoping for, right? Is that you have like, capacity building within teams in the schools. So I think, uh, I don't know if this is helpful, but sometimes individual teachers and building relationships with individual teachers is really um, uh, valuable, right? It helps me understand a little bit more about what's happening in the classrooms, a little bit more about what the needs are. And then also being able to work with groups is like, like in what I described for Heartland, I feel like that's the best thing we could hope for is that there's actually a group of people who feel like they have some agency and desire, you know, to take on holding some of that for their school. So. Um, hold on. Yeah. Uh, just as an aside, Bill, as our lead negotiator, are we still trying to get stipends for those positions into the teacher contracts and those those contracts are for you're you're muted but are they for are they for this next year the following you know the the year that we're currently budgeting i can't hear you yeah i 
Me either. Together? Is that yeah. better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have an extra button that sometimes gets pushed. Um, that has been part of the discussion so far. Um, it has not come up in the actual negotiation piece yet. Um, okay. Well, so Yeah, so the answer is yes. Okay, so if we can make sure that it gets into the negotiation discussions and then, but you are talking, when you do the negotiations, you're talking about the year that we are currently budgeting for. Is that right? Yeah, this is, yes. the three-year contract ends this year. Okay, so. So next the, school year is so the, what we're budgeting for. So my, my, uh, my next statement is to uh, the whole SU board please make sure that you put some of some set aside some money for that in your budgets because it won't matter whether it's in the contract or not if it doesn't go into the budgets thanks for that elizabeth i should say too there is like the there is a small um dei budget that does include some support for potentially roles like this next year so there is some money that's in there that's okay. being held. So if whatever details have yet to be worked out about what that might look like, but um, yeah. Well, I just, I just want to make sure that we board members are doing our part as well. That's great. Love it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Christine. You ready for my report? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought maybe you thought I had a question, but I just, uh, I don't have a question, but I do have a huge shout out to Tracy, who's really helped organize and um, move this work forward. Without her, we would not be anywhere near um, where we are. So appreciate her. She's doing a really wonderful job and, and really spending the time to, to listen and build relationship, which I think is really critical in this work. So a big shout out to Tracy. Um, let me pull up my report. And I will apologize now if you hear any loud noises in the background. Um, it's not a dog, it's my husband. Our basement is currently flooding and he's trying to, he's trying to, I don't know what he's trying to do. He's trying to siphon it out or something. So I'm apologizing in advance. Okay. All right. It seems like we were just together. We're a week early, which is nice, right before the holidays. Um, two procedures were in the report and in the portal, uh, procedure for homeless students and procedures for proficiency-based graduation requirements. I hope you had a chance to look at them. Um, are there any questions with either of those procedures? You know, Katie worked on the homeless um, procedure and Andrew with the proficiency-based graduation requirements, and they're both here and can help me answer. Uh, yeah, Bill, go ahead. Um, whoa, that was odd. Um, the, um, the homeless one looks great. Um, okay. The procedure prof proficiency, I think it would be useful, not necessarily this year, but at some point to put in uh, uh, procedures and expectations on what the assessment would look like. What what a summative piece of assessment for proficiency-based graduation standards. What are the standards for the standards? Got what it. are the standards for the assessment? A lot of times I have noticed in my professional career that uh, when dealing with proficiency-based standard measurement the the assessments are based upon really non based upon crap and let's put it base out there that okay. you know you 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 have a proficiency based standard and you base them all on a single presentation or i mean there needs to be some uh summative reliability and uh reliable and uh, measurable assessments that go into these proficiency-based graduation requirements, so. Okay. Angie, do you have any questions about that while, while we're together? 
No, I ju I just go was going to say um, oh, Bill's comment. It's about quality criteria and making yeah. sure that we have depth of knowledge, like the 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 range of knowledge re represented in those assessments. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, um, this was requested data by the board after Brittany or during Brittany's presentation last month. So Brittany is following up with um, the top minor behaviors, K8 and 912, and the top major behaviors, K8, 912. So you can see that um, for minor behaviors, K8 is disruption, then inappropriate physical contact, and defiance or noncompliance. Those are the top three. In the 9 to 12 world, um, it's a cell phone violation, uh, defiance and noncompliance and disrespect. And then major behaviors always um, involve uh, administration. So in K-8, it's physical aggression, leaving uh, class or lunchroom or wherever you are without permission and disrespect. And in 9-12, the top um, major behaviors leaving, cutting class, uh, skipping class, defiance and disrespect. Um, Brittany is on if there are specific questions about that data that anyone has. I can't, uh, Bill, is that you? That yeah. is me. Um, are there any cutoffs or, or procedures in place in which um, clarify for teachers and administrators, what's the difference between a major behavior uh, versus a major behavior that gets state reported. Uh, yeah, so I can share about that. So um, the teachers don't necessarily deal with the state reporting aspect of things. Um, however, we do have a major minor uh, response protocol document that outlines what the difference is between the minors and the majors. Um, so that we're making sure that we're collecting that data appropriately. And then from there, that, that data gets sent to the administration and to the, the people in each building who do the state reporting. And depending on uh, the different pieces and how the response, what responses are, are I guess, uh, followed through with, um, that's how we know what state what needs to be state reported. So the definitions are really kept with the administration on that one. And so I'd, I'd be interested to, to, to see those. My concern is um, a, in my personal experience, and no, my professional experience, uh, uh, buildings under reporting to the state, um, uh, major behaviors, uh, because, um, as you know, the state is looking at different and more varied criteria for funding. Um, and I don't want to, um, if ever that, um, that data piece is then used to factor in for funding, uh, especially for all the behavior staff that we use, um, I, I think the criteria should be very clear and concise about what's supposed to be state reported and what's not supposed to be state reported. So that's just my concern in that. Not with what you're doing with minor versus majors and what the staffs do. It's just there's that whole other piece which I think administrations struggle with for a couple of reasons. One, um, teachers have a tendency, uh, schools have a tendency in the past to try to underreport problems. And two, because the state guidelines are so fuzzy as well. So. It looks like Beth has a question, Bill. Is that okay? Okay. Beth? <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, I just had a question about like how deep, I guess, we dig into the disrespect data. Um, because it, uh, it seems like you know, if there's a if a student is bringing up an issue with equity, feeling maybe that they're not being respected as well, um, that person uh, in a position of power tends to feel disrespected. 
And so I can see how a student might be getting reported as being disrespected when they are actually trying to report an equity issue. And is there like how deep do we dig into our disrespect category around that? I mean, that's a great question, Beth. I think we really try hard to, um, with our practices around relationship building and collaborative problem solving to really hear from the student, um, you know, hear the student fully out to try to disaggregate where the disrespect is or lies. Um, and I don't know if Brittany has further, further information on how we um, use that data. Um, I, I mean, I don't specifically, and especially in terms of the, you know, digging into the disrespect per se. However, I do know that all the buildings are looking into their behavior data pretty regularly um, and trying to come up with patterns and figure out how to, how to be proactive in their responses to behaviors. Um, so I'm not sure about the disrespect per se, um, but that's certainly something we can look into. I'm assuming buildings have a some sort of flow chart that they use. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. We have a whole guide, um, wh which um, uh, administrators and Brittany was on that team worked on this summer. So it's consistent across the entire SU now, which is which is great because we can have conversations with each other because um, we're doing the same things in terms of behavior. Um, Rebecca, you have a question. Thank you, Christine. Um, uh, this information seems really valuable and, and helpful, um, and um, and I appreciate it. And I'm just wondering how does this information um, get broken down simply the way it is broken down here to community and to and to parents overall. I'm not saying specific parents, but overall and and i'm and i know that in our last one of our last meetings at the mount escutney school district meeting um, um it was mentioned that um behavior issues were down and so this becomes a really great tool um to have with community members and parents about um well these are the behaviors that we have problems with but also point to, well, where are they down? And mm -hmm. look at maybe why is it that they're down um, so that patterns can be identified, um, the community members can be informed, parents can have a sense of what some of the behavior issues in the school specifically are, even though they don't maybe affect their children. Right. Yep, and I think that's a great idea. They can certainly go in the newsletter. I know Brittany has in the past reported out on her, you know, the data dashboard, which um, is being uh, revamped or not revamped, but um, we're going to be using Edge Climber. Uh, she's going to share that out in the spring, so parents will have a, they'll be able to log in and see that data. Am I correct in that, um, Brittany? Yeah. So right now we. Uh... I kind of revamped the website, the data dashboard was on the website at the time, and um, I revamped it a little bit, made it a little bit more simple and uh, use the visuals from Edge Climber on that website. So we'll keep continue to grow that um, in a variety of ways. So that's that's up on our website right now live. Um, and I, I mean, it's not broken down by categories like these at this point in time. Uh, usually what I put on there is what I shared at the board report, something similar to that. So it's more of a longitudinal over the course of the year kind of graph. Um, however, we can certainly add something along these lines. You know, these are the areas that we're improving on. These are the areas that we're continuing to work on. And I, I think that's a, that it's a great idea for us to yep. um, improve our website in that way. All right, I will move on if there are no other questions. Um, the next slide, and I hope you have it. I had intended to bring you copies tonight, but since we're remote, um, this is the calendar, the proposed calendar for, for next year. It has um, gone uh, through 
we, we meet with the union and, and union leadership and go over it. They take it back to their membership and we meet again. So we've come up with a, a final draft tonight that we would like for you to consider approving, um, if not tonight, at the next meeting. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain entertain those. Uh, yes, Bill. Um, one issue that I've been hearing about and also living in my yep. school experience is the number of early releases. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it would be academically prudent to try to trim those in some way. Um, and I'm not sure how to do it. Okay. I have some suggestions, but you know, I'm not necessarily gonna throw them out here. Um, well, I may actually. Yeah, I mean, um, you might as well. You might as well. Yeah, well, we I guess, it. you know, one issue I have is uh, one, one place would be um, the uh, early release for vacation days, for example, December 20th. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I believe this uh, June 12th. Um, granted, I know it's the last day of school. At yeah. the same time, I always like to teach until the last minute of the day. And having a whole day to, to finish out my school year with the students, I really like that instead of only having a half a day. Um, also, the um, parent conference days, mm -hmm. um, early release on the uh, November 7th and on uh, April 10th, yep. um, they, we have the required uh, two days for parent conference in there. And I understand the, the desire for staff to have those half days. At the same time, it's not contracted. And it's also, uh, you're losing a full day in, of instruction because of that. Um, the other thing that uh, I've heard uh, regarding um, the, the usefulness of early uh, release for um, staff development and some other school districts have actually moved away from early release and started to do um, a, a delayed start. Yep. So a two hour delayed start, um, teachers come in 7.30, they're fresh, they're ready to have a lively discussion to get a lot of work done in staff development um, as opposed at the later part of the day. And also it doesn't interfere with uh, parents uh, after school plans. It doesn't interfere with students' sports transportation. Students aren't released and then are around and have to return for sports practice or, or whatever. And um, both groups are able to achieve more for that, especially seeing you've got middle school and high school students able to sleep in another couple hours. Right. And we all know how important that is. Um, and so I, I, I guess that's something that I don't know if at this late in the game, things can be changed, but uh, um, those are two concerns that I have been hearing about. Um, okay. From community members, other board members and so forth. Well, what I can offer is, um, I mean, I don't, I think we can take it back to, um, the ad team in the union. I think it should be, it should be approved by January. I mean, I think that mm -hmm. is the latest. Um, if you want us to take another look at it, we know early releases are difficult for families. We tried to place them, uh, you know, uh, there are aside from the, um, parent teacher conferences, which I know, I know teachers start at um, when kids are released and they usually go into the evening, most teachers that Thursday or offer evening conferences, which we know are better for many families. And I think just 
you know, having been a teacher, teaching all day and then going into six hours of conferences is really, it's it's a long, long, rough day. So I think that's part of the half day um, rationale, although I think it's been in place for a long time and it hasn't been examined, um, if, if that makes sense. The other ones are, uh, I think for professional development or for um, work that we wanna do, when we add them all up, it's it's three over the course of the year, if I'm doing my math correctly. Uh, September, March, and May. September, March. Yep. They're on Fridays, um, which we thought would be better for parents if they are, are you know, yeah. long weekend type things. Yeah, the other two are parent teacher and the other, you know, the, the staff um, on the 20th, the, the students do get out. I know staff, you know, have, you know, holiday gatherings at that time. Um, and they do, they do appreciate that, but that's something we could certainly look at. And I'm happy to try to do that before next month. If you, if well, you does 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 any other board member want to chime in? I'm 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 not speaking just for myself. I'm speaking to yeah. other people who have spoken to me. But um, I I I think the uh, half day let's call it creep began about four or five years ago when half day started to be added for staff development for work, of course, that needed to be done. Um, yeah. At the same time, uh, when you get up to uh, 10 half days, uh, mm -hmm. which, then you're looking at approximately five instructional days lost. Um, and I have heard, I know Woodstock does an early, uh, late start once a month, which yeah. I think, which, which I think, um, which I've heard has gone pretty well. And that is certainly something we can entertain. Yeah. It just involves communication and making a plan. Yeah. One thing Hartford has done is, uh, um, is of course we're limited on that because mm -hmm. of our contract of seven and a half hours, but, um, that the students come in, the middle school and high school students come in a little later so that they get to sleep in and the staff have that hour in the morning every day. Yeah. Um, um, it looks like Angie has her hand up, Bill. Is that okay for her to chime in? I, uh, Bill, can you tell me again what the hours were for that? Like, was it two hours? Was it three hours for a... Or a delayed start? Um, my understanding is the same as what Christine quoted was Woodstock, is they had a, a 10 o'clock start. So it was okay. a two hour a delay. So which allowed, you know, if you say teachers are going to come in at 7 30 and we're going to get going right on time, um, gives you a good solid two hours. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It looks like Megan has her hand up as well. I, I just have a quick question about the morning. My only concern would be that of, um, I know not every family does after school program or BTG, but that I know that saves my family with mm. the early releases. And I can see that that could be a struggle for um, people if they weren't able to do it in the morning, like what would that look like? If there was no before school care. If there's no before school care, yeah. Like right okay. now, I know there's um, a group of people that do count on that with the half a days. And yep. would that change if the um, time was changed to the morning? Becca? Christina, I really appreciate what you said earlier regarding um, how things are being done. And um, I appreciated hearing you say, you know, we've, it's always been done that way, but there's no harm in examining it. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to go back to the ad team and the, and the union leadership and, and talk it through and see if we can make some adjustments. That's, um, you know, we need to hear what the issues are, and and we know that early releases are difficult for for parents. Um, we, and yes, they have creeped up. I won't disagree with you, Bill. I think in the last couple of years, we've tried to really 
keep them at bay <laughs> and balance the work that needs to get done because in the contract now, I mean, we have five professional development days a year and that's it. So we, we do try to get some of the work done um, in these early release days. And I know from, from lots of conversations with staff, um, time is like the greatest um, need for staff. That's what we hear time and time again. It's time. We don't have enough time to do all the things that are requested of us or on our plates or to be prepared for um, to give our students the best experience possible. So it's just trying to balance all that, all the needs. Yep. And I don't expect, and I think in, anyone would expect this last moment to, 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 to make any significant changes or even the, any changes at all. But I think it's something to consider yep. Yep. Um, looking at. And, you know, I am more than willing to go to bat um, negotiation wise to try to get you some more days um, for staff development in that because I know all yeah. the work that uh, the the SU team, Angie in, in, in particular, is trying to do with these teachers with the new curriculum. Um, yeah, appreciate that. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to look. So um, it looks like Anne Marie has her hand up. Yeah, I just I just would say that I mean I understand you only have the five professional development days, so it would be good if we could negotiate more of those because I think from a parent's point of view, either the afternoon or the morning, they're both kind of a pain for working parents. So, um, you know, I would rather as a as a parent, I would rather the kids just have a full day off once in a while. That's easier on me than uh, you know coming to pick them up at. 11 30 or 12 or dropping them off at 10. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Anne Marie. Okay, so why don't I just take it back? We'll we'll just put it on pause. We won't adopt it tonight. We can certainly do that in January and we'll take another peek at it and maybe we can make some adjustments uh for next year uh with the goal of really taking a deep look for the following year. That sound okay? All right. Okay, um, bringing back, um, I, this this was brought up, I believe, at the SU board meeting. We did share this at the Mount of Scutney meeting last week, but wanted to bring it to the full board. There was a question about um, students, uh, our freshmen and math and the classes that they are going into. Are they prepared to take algebra when they are freshmen, um, freshman students at Windsor High School? So the data um, you know, is out of 58 students. We have one student in a algebra lab that, that really gets the student ready, as does foundations. And we have 16 students in foundations, 22 in algebra, 10 in geometry. So they've already completed their algebra requirement. And then we have some nine students placed in different um, other, uh, other options. Um, Kate is not here, but she did want me to let you know that um, the sending school makes the decision on where the students are going to be placed. So if they're going to go into foundations or algebra lab or algebra, um, she said 12 of the, I think 12 of the students that aren't in algebra, that are in algebra lab or foundations are coming from sending schools. So the, uh, what does that leave? Four or five of those students in algebra lab or foundations are Windsor um k-8 students if that makes sense so i don't know if there are questions on that but this is the, the data that was requested last month all right bill you have a question oh it's just that even for sending schools in weathersfield and in, in in heartland um in Cornish. having in, there's, in, other, in, there's other schools. No, I mean um, that send to other. We're sending from the SU out of yep. to um, uh, having um, that communication piece and that alignment to what the expectations are for, for an example, um, an algebra for a freshman to going to an algebra two class say, at Hartford. It's really important to 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 get those recommendations and that alignment as close as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the kids are ready. Yep. And sure. they're placed properly. Yeah. 
Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, this is just an FYI, the Southeast superintendents, uh, which I'm a part of the regional group, we have a legislative breakfast every year, an annual breakfast, and we kind of advocate for the things that we are hoping that our legislator, legislatures will, will take on in this session. So I just wanted to share that um, we had our breakfast on December 8th. It was very well attended. Um, Elizabeth was there in attendance as well as other uh, other representatives from our region. Um, we talked, we started with talking about some things that we're proud of as a region, which is we have started a um, Vermont Learning Collaborative, which has been, um, pre predated me. They've been trying to start this for years and use some ESSER funds to really get it up and running. So we do have a collaborative that's established. We've hired a director. We are starting to offer professional development. We are starting to, um, uh, really work together to um, fill positions that are those hard to fill, those hard to fill spots. So we're really proud of that work. Um, we've taken a position on literacy, really um, pushing, uh, be, you know, belief and work in the science of reading and making sure all our staff are on board with that because we know how important, um, we know the importance of learning to read early. So we were proud to share that. The other things that came up were building aid, which you've heard about. Um, building assessments were done across the state and um, there is work to figure out which buildings need the most work the soonest and, and how that is all going to play out and where the funding is going to come from. Um, there was talk about career and technical education and um, other concerns, which you continue to hear about from us is uh, hiring and retention of staff and mental health um, of students and staff and the impact of you know the ESSER funds going away, what that will be on our staff and our students. So those were the topics that were covered. We had a great discussion and we have a great group of legislatures, so um, very feel very supported by them. And I think, um, not my last slide, but next to last, Angie's gonna talk about the Title IX, this was a question that came up um, last month as well. So Angie, I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you, Christine. I have been um, trying to participate in Title IX sexual harassment training with uh, the lawyer, Heather Lynn. She has really become the state's um, expert at the Title IX and HHB hazing harassment and bullying um, law and how it impacts uh, schools. So in the training, she's talked about the legislative changes that were enacted perhaps this fall sometime. And the one, so as I went back through the um, materials that were provided, this was the one place where I could find information about it, that it is, um, it was expected, and I believe this did happen, to require that all sex-based harassment matters and not just sexual harassment, which currently it was, well, the current practice prior to this was just sexual harassment, be handled through the Title IX process. What that means is um, that that would come through the Title IX coordinator to determine whether or not the behavior is um, sexual harassment. So sex-based, they mean it is that it would not have happened if it weren't for the um, sex of the complainant, that's the person who is the potential target of, of specific behaviors. Um, and the reason that that, the reason that that was explained to us because they want to make sure that any, um, that some behaviors aren't going unaddressed. So if they come through the Title IX process, then the coordinator would, the coordinator right now holds that decision-making power of whether or not to pursue um, the complete um, Title IX process, um, but this would assure that um, fewer behaviors would be missed. Uh, that's the only information I could find because the slides from the November training that I was unable to attend have not been shared yet. Elizabeth, can I? Oh, sorry, Bill. What? No, I, Elizabeth I, has her hand. Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you for that, Angie. That I was the person who asked about that. And uh, I appreciate you you digging that up for me. Um, who is the Title IX coordinator for our SU? Me. Okay. 
So uh, are you ready for, um, are you ready to be no. able to handle? Okay. No, we're not ready. Um, we need to establish our Title IX process more clearly in the buildings. And if we had Title IX building-based coordinators, that would help somewhat. Um, and that is just a process. Uh, we came to you, to the board, and presented the, the Title IX online reporting form. Training for staff um, is the next step. And um, then really figuring out what the system looks like so that there's more support in the building for that work. We've had, some people have been trained. Heather Lynn does these, their three four-hour sessions and she does them in the worst time of the year, frankly, which is in October and November when there's a lot of things happening. So it's trying to make sure we get that training and hopefully she'll be offering more or the videos. I think she was supposed to provide the videos, which would also make it available when people are available. Okay, so in the, so what happens before, uh, before that's all, in, what happens in the meantime? I, mean, I, I think we're hearing about, we're hearing questions. Our principals know to, to contact me, to ask me questions about whether I, or not I think it needs to move into the process. And we are hearing, I am hearing about those situations. Okay, I'm, I'm just, with all the stuff that you do, Angie, and it is a lot, I'm, I'm concerned that there might be an uptick in Title IX cases coming in the in the coming months, and I just want to make sure that you're ready. So, I mean, last year, um, we I I learned the system, so I, at least I know I have some processes uh -huh. in place. Um, we it it is what it is. We have to respond, so we will yeah. do the best that we can, which is, and we will stay in compliance, which is the goal. And do you it's know not where to get? Easy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you know? Do you know where to seek outside support? Yeah. Our um our relationship with Heather Lynn and Pietro Lynn uh, is they are extremely uh, helpful and responsive, uh, which is really nice. Um, we also have um, uh, the like different ones of us that have been trained in it, and we can put our head collective heads together and support each other that way. Um, okay. So the principals have gotten, um, in recent years, I'd say last year was the first time they had this, where they are hel helping each other. If there is a um, hard case in a building, they the, the principal will go to that bill. A principal from one building will go to another building to do interviews and things. Last year, I had, um, as in the Title IX position, I, I can't do the investigations, which is a fancy word for interviewing um students involved or adults involved and um so Brittany has been that investigator for us for one case in another case we contracted with we stipended one of our um employees to be the investigator so we have some different ways to kind of help get the process because the process is very clearly articulated is it understandable that's a different thing it's complicated but it is clearly articul articulated in terms of the steps that have to happen Okay, because I tried reading the Title IX updates, and it's quite long. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm if you wanted to, <laughs> I I tried going on. I can't. I don't know where to find that information. So that I really rely on Heather Lynn's um, uh, knowledge, and she puts it out in a form that schools can then respond to, and like I can take it in, and I can understand what it means in terms of our system and how we and what's required of us to respond so if there's something a resource that you would could share with me that'd be great oh i'd be glad to i'll i'll okay i will send it to you in the next day great thank you elizabeth yep yep thanks a lot angie you're welcome there's a colleen has a question thanks um angie do you have a sense of can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, of the number of cases, I don't know, last year that might have fallen into this category? 
um Next that year. <laughs> yeah so um no i don't in terms of what might have happened I, um what our principals were dealing with i i don't know and Brittany might know this better than i do how they report um behaviors i don't need to know if there's a check a check box that the behavior of concern was sex-based okay. so um that would be um something i know that i think last year and without my book here i think i had two formal i went through what they call the grievance process which is basically the title IX process from start to finish two formal um situations last year and they um both happened in january so buckle up okay. right <laughs> and the whole um it, i mean there's a timeline it takes like 80 days to finish a a title nine investigation so it's, it's that's, a about, yeah. that's about correct yeah. So um, Angie's done a great job keeping us keeping us on track. We know we we know we have to figure this out because it does cons it it takes time. Um, so that is certainly um, a, a priority on our to do list currently. And I will say the the visit website is where we get our our toolkit. So that's where all of the resources that Angie's referring to um, live. I, I was just thinking that now that it exists. Um, you know, there can be more, like now that these updates exist, there will be more uh, incidents of them because they didn't exist before. Right. Yes, as, as we become more aware of what behaviors constitute Title yep. IX, um, by a violation of our Title IX policy. Um, the other thing the AOE has done is they offer um, lunch monthly lunch sessions where you can go and you can bring your questions to the to heather who hosts them so i think the state is recognizing the complexity of the laws and then how it's impacting um in, uh, schools and how they uh, respond to this kind of behavior with more support and every year uh, like i did part i looked at the slides from last year that she did every year she does the training or every time she does the training heather re works them and tries to get the language more clear and more clear. I mean, she's dealing with the law, which isn't always in layman's terms, right? So well, it's like 380 pages long. The updates is right. I mean, it's not possible really to not go into a coma while trying to read it. <laughs> it's quite long. Good bedtime reading, I guess. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. So there are no other questions. I just have one more slide and it shouldn't be take too long. I just wanted to let you know that um, Larry and I recently attended a, a Vermont School Business Officer, Vermont Superintendent Association training. It sounds like it was the first um, time that these groups have come together in this way. Um, for a training, it was called Effective Practices in School District Fiscal Planning and Management. Um, and it was really all about uh, some of the time was dedicated to understanding the new formula that we're using currently or we're going to be using or we are using um, as information comes out. And um, a, a, a big um, takeaway that Larry and I had from the training was that it would be really important to have some staffing rules in place as we move forward. Um, we have some currently in place, but Larry's going to work with principals, you know, over the course of the rest of this year to review what we have in place and add any additional rules that make sense. So, for example, a staffing rule is um, some of them are based on our um, education quality standards. Uh, K, I think it's K2. Um, the EQS standards say less than 20 students per classroom. Um, third grade and up, it's 25. So looking at those rules, making sure that we have them in place may come in handy um, in the future as we prepare for um, what they keep calling the fiscal cliff. Um, sounds horrible and I think we're doing a good job of being really cognizant of what the needs are for our students and balancing that with um, you know the the needs of our communities in terms of fiscally responsible. So it was a training. It was very informative. Two days. Um, we would go again and we have some work to do based on what we learned at that training. 
Yes, Elizabeth. Thanks, Christine. Sure. Uh, my next question is, uh, how are you and Larry and the principals working together to uh, kind of really dig into the new um, equalized pupil weighting formula and what yep. that means for not just for budgeting, but also for uh, the way we educate kids because it does weight. I mean, it, it's some of the weights are kind of philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say that Larry and Larry can pipe in as he sees fit. Um, we started hearing about the new weighting system, you know, a couple years ago, and I think we practiced with it last year. We did go to a training, one training that, that tried to describe it. It was very complicated, I have to say. I have a better understanding now. So it, with the numbers and, and the changes really rolling out now, um, in my meetings with principals, I've tried to explain what that means just on a basic level, because um, we're right in the middle of budget season. And so there was a uh, part of that training was, how are you going to bring this information back to your principals and help, you know, have them work with you on these things. So I think our plan is starting that work. It, it, it does apply to staffing roles or, or will yeah. help with that work. So that's our kind of inroad at this point. But um, I mean, they need to be they need to be part of the discussion for sure. Well, I, I my suggestion is I, I sent you and Larry and I think all the principal or all the board chairs the um, explanatory document from the joint fiscal office, mm -hmm. which was it was worked up for legislators who don't care about it at all. Mm -hmm. But they need to know about it and they need to understand it um, for people who aren't on school boards or don't follow right. education funding. It's very, uh, very simply explained. So um, just take a look at it. It might be yep. helpful. Yep, thank you. We'll definitely do that. All right, and that concludes my report. If there are any further questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll turn it right back over to you, Bill. But we can't hear you, Bill. You're still muted. <laughs> I you. just always assume that people really want to hear me so madly that they can read my lips. Um, okay, so I am going to go through this, and um, for the uh, the, uh, the first one here, I'm not going to ask for motions just because it's the first reading. Uh, C4 English language learners. Um, I, I think it's important to have a quick discussion here. Uh, this is one of the um, policies I have questions regarding if there are um, existing policies under this or not. Do we have an English learning policy or something that covers that already or? Uh, I don't not it's not coming to my brain angie do you know if there's a current policy angie also does our it's in yeah. charge of our ll program i i, I yeah i don't remember yeah. seeing yeah. any in in my quick memory so i wondered if anyone else did um other than that this is pretty boilerplate yeah. it basically states out legal federal legal state legal responsibilities so are there any other questions that people have or comments i'm just looking to see if there is one okay um one second Procedures. Uh, we do have, I, I see a policy from adopted in 2021. Yeah, I remembered those conversations. So we okay. do have one in place. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe it looks, to compare and contrast yeah. the two. Yeah. Okay. 
I'll put that on my to-do list. At quick, uh, yeah, there might be a few changes in here, but not too, too many. So it shouldn't take long, though. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, B20, personnel recruitment, selection, appointment, and background checks. This one really surprised me. Um, it, but same question, is there, a, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe there might be one and more, one or more policies that cover some of this information. Actually, I know there is, I can't remember it, but, um, It looks like we adopted it in 2019. Okay. Policy recruitment, selection, appointment, and criminal background, criminal record checks. Nikki, what would we do without you? The policy. I'm good at Googling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So again, I uh, uh, before the second read, I, I'd like to go through and look at comparison, contrast, and the C what sort of changes there are. Um, any other discussion, questions? Okay, moving right along, I will take a motion to, uh, um, to approve E20 community use of school facilities for the third reading. We did add that one question, Bill. I don't know if it's worth pointing out. Um, when you and I met, right. where there was an option, um, shall permit pos possession or use of a firearm or a dangerous or deadly weapon for instructional and educational purposes only. Yeah, and but I wanted to get a motion before, and if there isn't okay. really um, a, 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 a push to approve it, then we can uh, pull the motion. Nancy? So moved. Seconded, Davis. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussions. Christine, will you go over that piece that um, yep. I just yep. interrupted you? No, that's okay, I was out of yep. order. Thank you for <laughs> putting me in my place. Um, so Bill and I met, because this came up at our last meeting, um, there was discussion over whether or not firearms should be allowed in the school or not and so um we met and talked about uh, um, allowing them on a very limited basis only for instructional or educational purposes and that there would need to be some really um really clear procedures put in place for for when that happens and how that happens and uh i read reread the whole thing just to make sure and um in the in the opening uh, sentence for that section, um, it very clearly says the superintendent shall establish procedures for the use of school facilities for, by community members, which at minimum, and then it lists out, and, and one of those is shall permit possession or use of a firearm or dangerous or deadly weapons for instructional and educational purposes only. Um, that's pretty common um, in, in my experience, and I know in many rural um, schools throughout the state. Uh, hunter safety is uh, carried out and um, there's never any firing of these weapons, but sometimes a hunter safety instructor would like to bring either a dummy rifle or an example of a rifle to make a point about the safeties and the pieces. Um, I have uh, had uh, reenactments come for uh, historical demonstrations, which they fire muskets, unloaded muskets. They, there's no balls in them, but they fired those. I've had high school students bring um, uh, in in um, uh, military uniforms. 
to 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 discuss about the pieces and so forth about it and included swords and so forth and so but all of them went through a procedure and got permission before bringing them into the school is there any other questions discussions about this um uh this policy um i want to thank christine for taking uh the time to to go over it and meet with me to to come up with that very sticky question um but if there's no discussion i am going to call for a vote um all in favor of approving um E20. Bill? You'd, yes. When you're when you're taking a vote online, you and everybody's online, you have to do a roll call. Yes, for policy, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I know. No, uh -oh. you're absolutely right. Um I'm gonna take a roll call um for um E20 community use of school facilities. And uh, as I can't see everybody, I will try to call around the room as best I can. Uh, Elizabeth, how do you vote? Aye. Colleen? Aye. Davis? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Nicole? Aye. Um, Mark? Aye. Uh, Anne Marie. Aye. Thank you. I'm I'm functioning completely on memory here. Um, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, 13 others, who are we missing here? Uh, who have I missed? Um, Megan. Megan. Aye. Okay. Um, Beth, um, aye. Thank you, Beth. Jamie, aye. Thank you, Jamie. Is that everybody? And I am an eye. And thank you for helping me in my visual. Um, so that has been approved. Um, E42, uh, school entrance age policy. Uh, we touched on this a little bit um, last meeting, not really much. Just to rec we just changed the um, in the second bullet. I think we added preschool program. That's right. Yeah. Does anyone? I because it's just the second reading. I haven't called for a motion. Katie, go ahead. There was a question last time because we had universal pre-K and you asked me to look for some information about that. And in the Act 166 rules, um, it does state that for three, fours and fives, no matter where they are under the universal pre-K law, they do need to look at RSU's cutoff date for age eligibility. So that, that was the question that you asked last time. Yes, um, thank you for looking into that. You're so welcome. that basically makes it uh, the preschool bullet point important. Right. So I think originally we had universal pre-K. Um, yeah. There had been at one point a little bit of ambiguity on that, especially as children turn six. Um, so I did, did the digging. So it could go back to being stating universal pre-K instead of just our own preschool program. Um, That may be something that might be important 
to clarify that. Would it be called universal pre-K? The, it is, it, um, it has. The, the, the state program. Is called universal pre-K education. That's what you, okay. that's what it's called. So I think we wouldn't change preschool program. We would add universal pre-K in there as well. Unless you want to write it as for admission into a universal preschool program, a child must have attained the age of three. Because all the preschool programs within the SU are part of universal pre-K programs. Right. It's, it's or, in order to access the universal pre-K funds, you would have to be that and they have to abide by our age cutoffs. Okay. Let's make that change and then... Uh, it will be an easy pass next time. Thank you, Katie, for looking into that. And I'm very happy you put the cooking vest back on. Bread's it, baking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. On to what I think is actually the fourth reading. Um, I will take a motion to uh, approve C-28 transgender and gender non-conforming students. So move, Davis. Beth, second. Okay, thank you, Davis and Beth. Um, is there any discussion on this? Mark? Yeah, uh, on the draft I have, uh, page three, third paragraph down, um, it has listed reached age of majority. Um, I'm not sure that's accurate. I'm wondering if that is meant to be age of maturity in regards to the changing of student documents. Page three, third paragraph down. Uh, I'm going off my notes, I think it's the second or third line. We Bill, can't hear you, Bill, we can't hear you. Yeah. Students no longer enrolled in the district may have their permanent education records updated upon request of the parent's legal guardian of a minor student, a former yeah. student who, ha who ha former students who have reached the age of majority. Is it age of majority? I don't think it's the age of maturity. It's majority. It just seems like it, if you're going to have minority. It's 18 years old. Yeah. yeah. The age of majority. Yeah. It, yeah. It's not a term that gets used a lot kind of colloquially, but that is the legal term. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. I'm glad that was addressed. Thanks. Yep. It is technically no age of maturity uh, because that varies between you know, I think 30 and 42. <laughs> For some of us. Yes. Yeah. Any other discussion? Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I, I don't want to change the subject, but I like the way this is uh, worded. And I think we should um, word all of our our uh, policies just decide that we're going to word all of our pol policies in uh, meaningful language like this. Yeah, I I have to do a shout out to you, Elizabeth, for for sharing those documents and for Christine for taking the time of the documents. I mean, was um, it was the Burlington or was it? Yeah, yeah it was the Burlington Earth. model. Um, Christine took. Uh, what we got from asking legal advice on some of the changes uh, in some of the wording of the, the Hartford. And um, that really coincided well with what the Burlington policy used for wording and referencing. So um, that was a wonderful job that she did. 
Um, and she and I actually met on this as well. Can, can I shout out? Um, sorry, Bill, you didn't call on me. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, was, I was getting ready to. <laughs> um, I will say uh, shout out to Tracy because I was talking to her about it, and she said, "Wouldn't it make sense to take this to our transgender staff and 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 students?" So she took that on and did that, um, and they appreciated that and approved. Um, really didn't have many recommendations. They thought it was a really strong policy as well. So seems like it's a long time coming and it's and it's here, which is exciting. Yes. Elizabeth, was that an old hand that was up or a or a previous hand? Or do you have something else you want to add? No, that was it. And okay. and again, I don't want to change, you know, we are in the middle of a of a motion, so I don't want to change the subject matter. I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the language and the tone of the, and the kind of full explanation of the purpose of the policy. Yeah, a lot of workers went into this and I think the yeah. time we take has really paid off looking at uh, sources and so forth. Yep. So um, again, let's see how well I do. I, um, I will take a vote on a, what is it called Elizabeth? a roll it's not a roll call it's a yes it's a roll call vote roll call a roll call vote uh for uh c28 transgender and gender non-conforming students um and I has the motion has it already been moved yes okay davis so long ago. aye elizabeth aye beth enthusiastically aye Okay, um, Anne Marie. Aye. Jamie. Aye. Uh, Mark. Aye. Colleen. Aye. Rebecca. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Nikki. Aye. Did I miss anybody? Megan. Aye. Megan. Well, Bad. if I miss just one, I'm really getting better at this. Okay. And I am an I. So this has passed. Um, setting the next agenda. Um, we have, uh, I believe, that uh, the calendar should definitely go on there because we, we, we de do need to get to that next month, regardless of, 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 of what happens. Um, I've got um, uh, Tracy's report and then I'll put the calendar in mine. We'll put it under um, items for action as well. I've got Larry with financials next month. Larry, does that sound about right? Next month is January. That'll be the uh, end of Quarterly. the second quarter. It'll be yep. in the board portal. And yep. And then I've got um, C4 as a second read, B20 as a second read, and C42 as a third read. Um, and, and we paused the C80, which is the local wellness policy as our um, local wellness team is uh, has just met for the first time and they want to review and Let's be say, yeah. be oh, um, <laughs> I just took your pen out as a as a not necessarily a matter ready? of uh, procedure sure. let's see if I can get through through Nancy <laughs> um, um, I think the wellness policy would be another policy that would be good to bring to students as well yeah. see their perspective on it um yeah it, great yeah in fact part of the um guidance in um that policy there's a lot of procedures that go with it uh it, you have to have students on your local wellness team so there will be some students involved in it okay at that level at least um is is tracy planning on giving us some homework saying we have an extended break I'll let her speak to that, Tracy. Are you, you know, I I don't have anything right now, but uh, okay. I'll hit you up. I'll hit you up after the after the new year. Okay. Um, 
So, Bill, there is another um, B23 selection of library materials is um, on the the VSBA website as a policy to be. Okay. Reviewed. So I don't know if you want four policies next month or you want to leave it at three or you just. Uh, I, I, I would prefer to get it on there just because <laughs> I know that is a political hot button issue. I'd like to take our time on it and. Uh, okay. I'll add it. Even if it's a first read, we, you know, get everyone to read it through and sort of banter it around really quickly. Okay. And I think I think two of them uh, on already the English language learners and the uh, recruitment piece. Once we uh, do the pre work of looking at the existing policies and see what changes, those should those should be pretty quick to get through. They're very procedural. Yep. And uh, I think the age school entrance age policy is just, just going to be a straight pretty much just a straight vote. I think that's pretty solid, especially with all the, um, the, the uh, with the time that Katie took to, to look into it before this meeting. So thank you. Okay. Do we have a need for executive session or? I know Anne-Marie and uh, Christine are going to chat about something um, after this, not SU related, but for a meeting that we have up coming up yep. Thursday. Just kind of be on the same page, which may run into a executive session, but if we can nip this in the butt, then no. Yep. Okay, <laughs> I will take a motion to end uh this um su school board meeting no one wants to end i know i'm just I'll end. okay <laughs> i have kids Nikki. coming in and out <laughs> i want to give other people a chance to get uh, nancy you are our our workhorse second person so come on take second Second. Okay. <laughs> um, because it's not a policy, I will take a voice vote unless Elizabeth is going to tell me I can't. <laughs> is Elizabeth here? She gave you the thumbs up. Okay. All in favor of ending, uh, uh, exiting this meeting, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.